Welcome to the Emirates Society of Emergency Medicine Emergency Ultrasound Lecture Series. My name is Rasha Bohumeid and we will be talking about inferior vena cava ultrasound. The objectives of this presentation is to review the indications for performing a bedside ultrasound of the IVC, the technique of performing the exam, and how to use sonographic findings to guide assessment of intravascular volume. We're also going to review the literature and evidence behind that. In 2008, ASAP Clinical Policy Statement on Emergency Ultrasound Guidelines included the evaluation of intravascular volume status and estimation of central venous pressure based on sonographic examination of the inferior vena cava. Since then, the use of IVC in the emergency department has been gaining more popularity. The primary utility of bedside ultrasound of the IVC is to aid in the assessment of intravascular volume status of the patient. This may be a particular utility in cases of undifferentiated hypotension or other scenarios of abnormal volume states such as sepsis, dehydration, hemorrhage, or heart failure. Changes in volume status will be reflected in sonographic evaluation of the IVC where increased or decreased collapsibility of the vessel will help guide clinical management of the patient. The combination of the absolute diameter of the IVC and the degree of collapsibility with respiration may give an estimate of volume status and substitute for more invasive measurements. Reviewing the anatomy and the physiology of IVC is important to understand this ultrasound exam. The IVC is a major mean of venous return. It's a thin-walled vessel with high compliance. Changes in the diameter of the IVC reflects changes in pressure. It is in close proximity of the right atrium. Therefore, the theory is that the IVC could be a surrogate for central venous pressure. As said, that the IVC is a thin-walled compliant vessel that adjusts to the body volume status by changing its diameter depending on the total body fluid volume. The vessel contracts and expands with respiration. I tried to simplify the IVC physiology in the following diagram. So this is in spontaneously breathing patient. During inspiration, the intrathoracic pressure will decrease, therefore increasing the venous return to the heart and therefore the IVC will collapse. While during exhalation, the intrathoracic pressure increases and therefore decreasing the venous return and the IVC returns to its baseline diameter and expands. This is side by side the different physiology of the IVC during inspiration and exhalation of a spontaneously breathing patient. The IVC physiology is different when the patient is mechanically ventilated. In patients with mechanical ventilation and no spontaneous breathing activity, the cyclic variation of intrathoracic pressure induced by the ventilation creates a cyclic variation in the right ventricle preload mimicking reversible and limited volume expansion. So during insufflation, the intrathoracic pressure increases. The positive pressure is transmitted to the pericardium and the right atrium, creating a decrease in the pressure gradient of the venous return, and therefore the IVC expands. While during expiration, the intrathoracic pressure is much lower, and therefore the pressure gradient will decrease, increasing the venous return, and therefore the IVC will collapse. So in summary, this is side by side the IVC physiology in a mechanically ventilated patient and the difference in the IVC diameter during insufflation and expiration. Respiratory variation of the IVC diameter 
will be observed only in patient in whom the right atrial pressure is not high, indicating that the right ventricle preload dependence. The IVC diameter respiratory variation can therefore predict the hemodynamic response to volume challenge. Respiratory variation of IVC diameter are greater in patients who will respond to fluid expansion. After fluid infusion, respiratory variation of IVC diameter decreased significantly in these patients. Assessment of respiratory variation of IVC diameter is an easy and useful tool to help predict the response to volume challenge, even with minimal experience. These consequences of mechanical ventilation on variation of venous return are not altered by positive pressure ventilation. Another important concept, apart from the absolute diameter of the IVC, is measuring the collapsibility of the IVC. In state of low intravascular volume, the percentage of collapse is higher when compared to the state of intravascular volume overload. This is quantified by the calculation of the Cavell index, where the IVC diameter during expiration is measured, where you subtract the maximum diameter of the vessel with the minimum diameter of the vessel and divide it by the maximum diameter of the vessel. The Cavell index is a percentage and where the number is close to 100 is indicative of almost complete collapse and therefore volume depletion, while a number close to zero suggests minimal collapse and likely volume overload. In the next few slides, we will be reviewing the technique of performing the IVC ultrasound. The scan is performed with a patient in a supine position. The degree of elevation of the head has not been shown to have a significant difference in the measurement. A low frequency probe, such as the abdominal or a curvilinear probe, is used for this exam. You can also use a phased array probe if that is available. There are two approaches to perform IVC ultrasound. The first is to obtain a subxiphoid view of the heart by placing the probe on the patient's abdomen just below the xiphoid process with a probe marker towards the patient's right or at 9 o'clock. Once an appropriate subxiphoid view of the heart is obtained, the probe is rotated 90 degrees until the marker is pointing towards the patient's head. At this point, the IVC should be visualized in a longitudinal plane as it enters the right atrium. These are still images that represent the picture on the left side of the screen is a picture of the IVC going through the liver and merging with the right atrium, while the picture on the right side of the screen is an abdominal aorta going through the liver and behind the heart. You can see how easily both vessels can be mistaken. The most important part is to visualize the IVC entering the right atrium. This is the only way to distinguish the IVC from the abdominal aorta. A second approach is to scan the liver as an acoustic window by placing the probe in the right anterior mid-axillary line, similar to the placement of Morrison's pouch when you perform a fast exam the marker pointing towards the patient's head. By scanning more anteriorly and cephalad than the Morrison's pouch view, the IVC can be visualized running longitudinally adjacent to the liver and crossing the diaphragm. Following the vessel along until it enters the right atrium allows confirming that the IVC is being visualized rather than the aorta. In this ultrasound clip here, you can see two vessels running parallel to each other. And just by looking at it, it might be difficult to distinguish between which one is the aorta and which one is the IVC. Sometimes placing Doppler can be helpful, but this is why following the vessel to the chest is a more useful technique. So this is just an alternative way of evaluating the IVC. The first approach we describe, which is the subxiphoid approach, 
is what is most commonly referred to in the resources and the literature. When measuring the diameter of the IVC, it's important because you want to use this diameter to calculate the caval index. The IVC should be measured two centimeters from where it enters the right atrium. And this is another still image that shows how to measure the IVC. They take about two centimeters from the entrance into the right atrium and measure the diameter of the IVC. An alternative way to visualize respiratory variation is to use M mode. With the beam overlying the IVC two centimeters from the right atrium junction. The inspiratory and expiratory diameter can then be measured on the M mode image at the smallest and the largest location. This is an example of an M mode image. You'll see on the left side, you'll see almost completely collapsible IVC with a cable index calculated at 60% while on the right side, the caval index is close to zero, indicating minimally collapsible IVC. Frankly speaking, you don't even need to measure and have these numbers. Just visually looking at the IVC and the M mode graph, you can definitely see that the IVC is collapsible on the left compared to the right. These are ultrasound representations of the different states of the IVC. In the images on the top of the screen, you can see the IVC is distended with minimal respiratory variation. When you compare it to the images in the lower part of the screen, you can see that the IVC is small and completely collapsed. So an important question here, should you give IV fluids to patients who are hypotensive based on their IVC evaluation? A number of studies have suggested that the IVC represents the central venous pressure given its close proximity to the right atrium. And they rely on the central venous pressure to evaluate fluid responsiveness. So let's go and review the literature. There are a number of studies that have been conducted re regarding the correlation of the absolute IVC diameter and the cable index with the CVP measurements. And these are two of the various studies. So in patients with volume depletion, the IVC diameter will be small and the percentage collapse will be greater than 50% while in patients with volume overload, the IVC diameter will be large with minimal collapse with respiration. However, going back to the main question, so we know that IVC and CVP are correlating, but the next question is, does CVP actually correlate with fluid responsiveness? In this paper published in CHESS 2008, a systematic review demonstrated a very poor correlation between CVP and blood volume, as well as inability of the CVP or delta CVP to predict hemodynamic response to a fluid challenge, and therefore concluded that CVP should not be used to make a clinical decision regarding fluid management. So going back to the question, does the IVC then correlate with fluid responsiveness? In this paper published in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2012, a meta-analysis of five studies concluded that a moderate level of evidence suggests that the IVC diameter is consistently low in hypovolemic status when compared to euvolemic status. This table is from one of the studies included in this meta-analysis. 
The study was done in an ICU setting with 23 ventilated patients who were septic. Measurements were performed at baseline and after volume expansion. Patients were separated into responders when the cable index was greater than 15 and non-responders when the cable index was less than 15. The results of the study showed that using a threshold of the distensibility index of the IVC of 18%, responders and non-responders were discriminated with 90% sensitivity and 90% specificity. And a strong correlation was observed between the distensibility of the IVC diameter at baseline and the cable index increase following blood volume expansion. So baseline central venous pressure did not accu accurately predict volume responsiveness. So this is another study that goes against using the CVP. And the conclusion from this study is that they suggest using respiratory changes in IVC is accurate measure of predicting fluid responsiveness in septic patients. How about in spontaneously breathing patients? In this the paper, they evaluated 40 patients who were spontaneously breathing who were hypotensive for various reasons, including sepsis, hemorrhage, dehydration. And the conclusion from this paper is that in spontaneously breathing patients, a collapsible IVC of greater than 40% are usually associated with fluid responsiveness, while a collapsible IVC of less than 40% do not exclude volume responsiveness. Therefore, from this study, they indicate that a collapsible IVC, you can still give fluid, but a dilated IVC does not rule out fluid responsiveness. So using the IVC to evaluate volume responsiveness is a great additional tool. It is fast, reliable, reproducible, and non-invasive. So use this tool when you evaluate your patient. When the IVC is small in diameter and collapsed, fluid is the way to go. However, you have to understand the limitation that if the IVC is distended and non-collapsible, that does not rule out fluid responsiveness. Some important pitfalls to mention. Plethoric IVC is not always from volume overload. Remember, there are other causes for distended IVC, including tension pneumothorax, massive pulmonary embolism, pericardial tamponade, and mitral regurgitation or aortic stenosis. There are multiple other sonographic findings that can be used as tool to assess volume status. In this presentation, we discussed the use of IVC. The other sonographic findings, including B-lines, cardiac output, and carotid flow times are interesting other modalities that are beyond the scope of this presentation. So in summary, IVC evaluation for volume status assessment is easy, non-invasive, reproducible, and fast. But you should also understand the limitation of this study. Small collapsible IVC give fluids. Plethoric IVC may still need fluid. Therefore, assess your patient, use other tool, and use your clinical judgment. Thank you for your attention, and here are the references used for this presentation.